We'd like to begin today, uh, if everyone could please stand for the presentation of the colors. Immediately after the presentation of colors, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance led by our color guard. I'd like to start by thanking everyone uh, for attending the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association National Roundtable. I'd particularly like to thank Senator Begich for hosting this event and for all the trouble you had to go through to get here. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's classic Alaska, so don't... Anytime you get to the airport, you anticipate something. So, yes, indeed. And something happens. So sorry. I'd like to also thank all of our guests. I notice we have a lot of board members of the Kenai River Sport Fishing Association and the association's executive director, Ricky Geese. So thank you all for attending. The 2013 Mangusson-Stevens Act reauthorization is important to the entire fishing community. And I'm sure that all of the stakeholder groups, whether they're commercial fishermen, aquaculturists, environmentalists, habitat experts, they're all going to want to be heard from during the reauthorization. And through that process, there are going to be various vehicles and various means for each of those groups to be heard. What we're going to do today is talk about national recreational fishing issues. And I'll give you some background. When the Magnuson-Stevens Act first passed back in 1976, its focus was very simple and very clear. Its focus was to extend the U.S. economic zone out to 200 miles, uh, thereby to protect and better manage the impact of foreign fishing vessels that were fishing off our nation's coast. Now, we went through a number of subsequent reauthorizations, and a number of significant progress was made over a broad set of issues. Uh, progress has been made towards ending overfishing. Depending on who you ask, the National Marine Fisheries Service would say that they have ended overfishing of commercial uh, species. Uh, certainly, um, they have made great progress towards rebuilding depleted stocks. They've made great progress towards protecting habitat and a number of other improvements. However, there's always a however. During this process, when all this progress was made in the management of commercial fishing, Recreational fishing issues were not deeply addressed. And worse yet, the same great statutes and language and policy that was adapted for commercial fishing was applied literally to recreational fishing with very mixed results. Just to give you some impact, there are approximately 48 million recreational anglers, and somewhere around 11 million of those fish in salt water off our nation's coasts. This generates an enormous economic output that reaches into the tens of billions of dollars, and we need this upcoming reauthorization of Magnuson-Stevens to 
better address the needs of recreational fishing and the recreational fishing stakeholders because it's simply too big and too important to the economy to be ignored any longer. Today, we're going to present five prime issues that the recreational fishing community would like to see addressed in the next reauthorization. And to do that and to accomplish that, we've assembled a panel of experts that represents a broad range of key stakeholder groups from around the country. Uh, let me introduce the panel to you now. On my immediate, on my far right, is Tom Domerick. Tom is the president of the National Marine Manufacturers Association. Right next to me is Jeff Angers. He's the president of the Center for Coastal Conservation. You all know Senator Baggage, who's hosting this event. Uh, right opposite him, uh, next to Raleigh, I'll get back to you, Raleigh, we have George <laughs> Cooper. George Cooper represents the president of the American Sport Fishing Association, and he himself is the past president of the Theodore Roosevelt <coughs> Conservation Partnership. And next to him, we're very happy to have Pat Murray, who is the president of the Coastal, Con of the Coastal Conservation Association. I didn't forget Raleigh. Raleigh is our moderator for this panel. Raleigh Schmitten is a past uh, administrator of the National Marine Fishery Service, and he has a career with the National Marine Fishery Service and managing fishery that dates well over 25 years. To my knowledge, he was the longest serving head of the National Marine Fishery Service. His time of service spanned both the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. So these are the panelists. Uh, the five issues will be presented by them, but to kick things off, I'm going to pass things over to our moderator, uh, Raleigh Schmitten, who is going to give us some oversight. Thank you very much, Phil, and good afternoon, everyone. You know, what an exciting two days this has been. And before I uh, forget my manners, there are a couple important thank yous to make. And the first is a very special thank you to you, Senator Begish, for your willingness to be here and to listen to recreational fishing men and women. Uh, it means a lot and it's appreciated. Uh, plus, a huge thank you to the Kenai Sports Fishing Association. Uh, the sponsors of the Kenai Classic, this is my first. It was outstanding. And finally, uh, to you in the audience, uh, representing the uh, sports fishing advocates and sponsors that are here, thank all of you. You know, for me, it's been great to be back on the Kenai after 31 years. Uh, as uh, Phil said, I am Raleigh Smith, and I'm your moderator. I'm a retired marine fisheries manager. I live on Sockeye Point at Lake Wenatchee, Washington. The name uh, Sockeye Point gives away my recent occupation. <laughs> you know why it's a bit minor compared to the guides here in the Kenai. I fished 15 of the last 18 days for salmon. Uh, I'm a, a guide, uh, my, but my services are free. Uh, but I'm very selective as to who I take. And I take kids that have never caught a salmon. I take uh, elderly that... Uh, remember catching fish but don't have the means to do that anymore. I take people that are in poor health that possibly or very likely are catching their last fish in their life. And then uh, throwing a little excitement, every Wednesday is Women's Day and I take women out and we have a wonderful time. You know, I rarely fish when I'm guiding, uh, but I get a limit of happiness out of watching these people catch fish and the smiles on their face, and it gives me a chance to introduce our sport and conservation of fisheries. Now, my whole life has been around fisheries. Uh, oddly enough, my father and son were both commercial fishermen, uh, the son here in Alaska. Uh, so as their regulator at times, we had some very interesting dinner topics. <laughs> I've had the pleasure and the, I guess the privilege of being the Washington State Director of Fisheries, uh, I was the National Marine Fishery Service West Coast Director for many years, uh, later than, as indicated, the uh, head of National Marine Fishery Service, the Assistant Administrator. But along the way, I've had a chance to connect, especially to Alaska. I've served on the Pacific and the North Pacific Councils. I've served on the Pacific Salmon Commission. 
came from the East Coast. Uh, I was on the International Atlantic Tuna, Tuna Commission, uh, the North Atlantic Salmon Commission, and back again uh, for 14 years on the International Whaling Commission. And I spent all 14 years uh, working with the uh, Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission out of Barrow. So uh, retired after 38 years, uh, both state and federal service, uh, was appointed to the Washington State Fish and Wildlife Commission, which I continue to serve as. Want to end with a, a few quick thoughts on what recreational fishermen stand for. And uh, Ricky Geese, uh, the executive director for CURSA, and I both serve on a, a small group that was formed by the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation uh, Partnership. And our task was to develop a marine fisheries vision statement. Well, we've only met once, but we have developed the general categories, and I'll touch on them quickly then and start the panels. The first is conservation. We believe that recreational anglers place conservation first in an effort to have healthy fisheries for both now and in the future. The second is environmental stewardship. Marine recreational anglers are strong environmental supporters. We're concerned about issues such as healthy fish habitat, water quality, red tide, ocean acidification, and overfishing. Number three is fishing opportunity. And yes, our community uh, likes to catch fish just the same as the commercial community, but not in just numbers of fish is defined as maximum sustainable yield, uh, annual catch limits, optimum yield, figures or terms that are in the Magnuson-Stevens Act. We support the quality of the experience, making family part of fishing and the opportunities to catch uh, large fish and increasing numbers of fish. Fourth is legacy. Recreational fishermen want to leave a fishing experience for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations, just the same as that we are having it today here in the Kenai. The fifth and very important is economic stability and growth. You know, we understand and support the need to keep our industry viable, support the R&D needs for boats and motors and better conservation-oriented equipment. And finally, the last is political strength. We seek political strength to achieve our goals. There are some 40 million recreational fisheries. Of that, as indicated, 11 million of those are marine anglers and we seek to harness this strength uh, for the betterment of both <coughs> fish and fishermen. But today we, we do have a tremendous panel to focus on issues of, of national significance to the recreational community, as well as the key issue of the reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Management <coughs> and Conservation Act. So we'll start with our uh, first speaker, uh, that's Tom Domrich who is the president of the National Marine Fisheries Manufacturing, Manufacturing Association, and he's going to hit the topic, the economic importance of recreational fishing and boating. Thank you, Riley. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and thank you, Senator Begich. Our forefathers understood the importance, the economic and social importance of recreational fishing and boating. Today, uh, when we talk to some policymakers, we're left with the, the view that uh, outdoor recreation is what you do with leftover land, leftover time, and leftover money. And that could not be further from the truth. Uh, outdoor recreation is a major economic driver in our country. And the Outdoor Industry Association released a study earlier this year that NMMA participated in that estimated that outdoor recreation is responsible for $646 billion of direct spending annually. And boating and fishing represent 20% of those expenditures. So one out of every $5 spent on outdoor recreation in this country is for fishing and boating. And I believe on the screen you'll see some, some numbers related to that. Recreational boating drives $121 billion of economic activity in this country each year. It supports over 900,000 American jobs. 
uh, supports over nearly 35,000 American businesses, generates $40 billion in annual labor income, and drives $83 billion in annual spending. As Phil mentioned, there are 48 million recreational anglers in the United States, and 11 million of them are saltwater anglers. And they drive economic activity of, of over $70 billion a year, support over 450,000 American jobs, and generate $20 billion or more in annual labor income. The recreational angling community is tied directly to the health of and access to our nation's aquatic resources. That's why through fishing license sales, excise, excise taxes on fishing equipment and motorboat fuel, recreational fishermen and boaters contribute about $1 billion annually to fisheries conservation and public access improvements. An amount that no other user group comes close to matching. In many ways, the general lack of understanding of the economic, social, and co conservation contributions and values of recreational fishing has been a detriment to our community. And this is uh, particularly true when it comes to saltwater fishing. Policymakers and fishery managers have devoted the vast majority of their attention toward managing commercial fishing sustainability in large part because it's responsible for 98% of all fish harvest. Recreational fishing, on the other hand, has long been an afterthought in terms of research, data collection, and management focus. But according to the National Marine Fisheries' own data, those 2% of fish caught by recreational fishermen support a substantial economic engine that is on par with commercial fishing. We are a significant economic driver and provide significant economic and social benefits to this country. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the second issue is examining how mixed sector fisheries are allocated. As said, Jeff and Angers, who is the president of the uh, Center for Coastal Conservation, take the floor. Jeff. Thank you, Raleigh, and, and thank you, Tom. Um, uh, Senator Begich, thank you for, for, for hosting this gathering and to, and, and to our friends uh, here on, on the Kenai River. This, is, this has been a beautiful few days. Um, they've asked me to talk about what, what I believe is the most controversial issue um, in, 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 in discussing fisheries, and it's the question of who gets the fish. Um, it's a question of allocating uh, the fish between, between sectors. Um, the Magnuson-Stevens Act um, calls for allocations, and I believe the PowerPoint will show exactly what the statute says, that allocations should be fair and equitable, reasonably calculated to promote conservation and carried out in such a manner that no particular individual, corporation, or <coughs> entity acquires an excessive share of, of such a privilege. Um, we have uh, noted with accuracy that uh, many of those allocations have been set. Um, um, uh, the allocations of harvestable quota for each sector have been based off of determinations made decades ago. And uh, both the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Regional Fishery Management Councils all over the country are unable or unwilling to revisit those allocations. Um, the, the economic, uh, and, and by the way, I, I want to make clear as we, as we have our discussion. Senator, we've spoken of this before. If, the, uh, if, if all of the fish, if fisheries in the other 49 states were managed uh, like they were managed here, we don't think we'd be having, uh, having all the problems that we've got in the other 49 states. Uh, so, so our comments today are, are focused on, on the lower 48. Um, the economic and social contributions of the recreational angling community uh, often far outweigh those of the commercial fishing industry, yet old mindsets are slow to change. And the challenge facing us um, is to have the current values and realities recognized, as Tom just mentioned, and hopefully have allocations shifted 
to re reflect the greater economic benefit of robust recreational fisheries. It's a pretty easy concept. In mixed use fisheries, where there's both a, a recreational and a commercial component, there is a lot more value in, in recreational opportunity to catch a fish than there may be in the same fish actually being harvested commercially. Uh, there are some simple and sound reasons for that. Um, many folks uh, uh, who I know spend a lot of time trying to hide from their spouses all of the money that they spend on their outdoor pursuits. The reality is that a recreational angler spends money on rods, reels, boats, trailers, tackle, motels, baits, restaurants, lots of other things, all based on the chance that if he goes fishing, he might catch one. And a commercial fisherman spends as little money as possible until he catches and sells a fish at a market-driven price. That's the world in which we live. Um, struggling to shake its history as an agency dedicated solely to the promotion of the commercial fishing industry, NOAA Fisheries is often viewed with tremendous distrust by the recreational fishing community. With the agency now under enormous pressure to uphold tough new conservation laws and deadlines, the, this federal system often seems as unstable as a sandbar when the tide is changing. Um, the, the erosion of faith um, uh, in NOAA fisheries really permeates the recreational fishing community, and as I've noted, it's, it's not undeserved. Among other things, recreational anglers have routinely found themselves shortchanged on allocations for mixed-use stocks that are pursued by both anglers and industrial boats. And these allocations, as I noted, were usually set using backward-looking catch histories, and managers often selected suspiciously short time frames uh, that grossly inflated commercial catch to determine a percentage for each sector. And now the federal managers are notoriously unwilling to revisit any of the allocation uh, decisions despite literally cosmic changes in economics and demographics surrounding those fisheries. Uh, allocation in mixed-use fisheries is a mess. And for all of the reasons that we've heard, it's too hot, it's too political, there's not enough time, we've always heard there's not enough time to, to rationally approach it. For every fishery examined in the peer-reviewed literature on fishery allocation, economic value criteria indicate that allocation should shift toward the recreational sector. Yet there's currently no methodology for changing allocation and a deafening silence uh, from the agency. Um, this, this deadline, th excuse me, this deadlock is due uh, to the status quo bias at the council um, and, within the, and within the agency, which is driven by, by loss aversion and an uneven collective action playing field. The value gains from allocating more fish to the recreational sector are indeed uncertain due to the nature of the data and the estimation techniques that the agency uses. While we know for certain that losses to the commercial sector will be certain if, uh, w when dealing with a rebuilt stock with, with, with hard catch limits. So the councils would rather make no change than one that improves overall value in fishery because they fear that the uncertain benefits will not outweigh the certain losses. It's the very essence of loss averting behavior. Uh, allocation is the critical component of fisheries management that remains ignored by, by managers. The growing issue, as I said, is recreational effort and participation, which will continue to increase with population growth and more people moving to coastal states. That growth makes a rational case for increased allocations to the recreational sector in some fisheries, as do the economic arguments that have been made in a, in a number of these. Perhaps one workable solution is to allocate any future increases in harvest limits to the recreational fishery um, as the stock recovers. In catch share fisheries that are declared rebuilt, all increases in total allowable catch going forward should be allocated to the recreational sector. As a rule, 
catch share participants should not be insulated from the marketplace. The ability of other participants and ideally states to conduct transactions in catch share systems to benefit their citizens must be explored in this next reauthorization. For all fishery management programs, including catch shares, the underlying harvest allocations to specific sectors should be revisited on a regular basis not to exceed three years. And the basis for allocation should include con consideration of conservation, social, and economic criteria used, used to specify maximum economic yield and in furtherance of the goal of whatever fishery management plan is on the table. The Pacific Northwest from, from which um, uh, Raleigh hails uh, offers a great uh, lesson to us. In an area where many other fisheries are, are heralded, uh, the, the unheralded Dungeness crab um, was the focal point of a remarkable victory uh, on the state level um, as we discuss allocation. When conservationists argue for the reallocation of a fishery based on these modern criteria of, of, of economics, social, and conservation, uh, the blueprint for what we're talking about happened in, in the state of Washington. Um, when we boil away all the other rhetoric, and I'll get to the specifics in a moment, and brush aside all of the excuses as to why we can't reallocate, um, we may be stunned to discover just exactly how many other fisheries uh, are completely upside down like the Dungeness crab was. The total, the total amount of the annual commercial crab harvest in Washington's Puget Sound, I'll just use a few numbers, was about 21 million pounds while the recreational harvest was 1.3 million pounds. The, the state's own economic analysis showed that re recreational crabbers returned a net economic value of $24 million to the state, while the commercial crab harvesters returned $18 million to the state. So the 6% of recreationally harvested crab returned more, more economic value than the 94% of the commercially caught crab. Um, the state of Washington acted immediately, um, but that, that, that screaming, glaring inequity wasn't going to right itself, and recreational anglers had to be engaged in the process, and this is, this is always a contentious issue, and I'm sure Raleigh can attest to the fact that it surely was there. As ridiculous as that allocation was, it, uh, it is probably no worse uh, than, than that of many other fisheries in, in, in other parts of the country where federal managers have simply refused to crack the egg on out reallocation. Uh, how many of the problems that we grapple with in recreational fisheries could be solved by following the example set in this particular fishery? We should be committed to finding out. Um, in 2009, at the request of NOAA Fisheries, Texas A&M scientists published um, a, a bioeconomic analysis of of uh, the title of the paper, the bioeconomic analysis of the Red Snapper rebuilding plan and transferable rights policies in the Gulf of Mexico. The focus was, was on the net present value of the, of the stream of all economic benefits from all sectors in the Gulf shrimp and reef fish fisheries. Um, the, uh, and that, that, that time frame was 2009 through 2032. The net present value of the directed commercial fishery uh, for red snapper in, in the Gulf was $0.27 billion. That's fourth place among the four sectors. Third place, the charter for higher sector, $0.83 billion. Second place, the shrimp fishery, $1.6 billion. But the private recreational fishing sector far outpaced the other three, $9.1 billion. So in the Gulf, in this fishery, the stream of economic benefits provided by anglers is threefold larger than all the other sectors combined. Gulf Red Snapper is hot. It is the 2013 poster child and hot potato in fisheries management all over the country. Uh, yet these types of economic numbers don't really see the light of day in, in, in this important fishery that is, for all intents and purposes, the filet mignon of the, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, a fishery where 398 commercial harvesters are guaranteed 51% of the resource. A fishery where 4 million 
recreational anglers were told this spring to prepare for the shortest season in history, as short as nine days, despite a recovering stock. Well, a federal judge ruled against NOAA fisheries um, and set in motion an incredible roller coaster drama for everyone interested in this particular fishery that in the end has resulted in the same 398 commercial harvesters getting the same 51% of the, of the fishery and recreational anglers as an afterthought. Senator, there's much that anglers in the data poor Southeast uh, can learn from our friends here in the North Pacific and the Pacific Northwest. Um, in the reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, we want to ensure that, that allocation is revisited every three years and that we use the modern criteria, conservation, social, and economic criteria that we discussed. We are, we are hopeful, Senator, to, to look to you for leadership on this, on this very important issue. Jeff, th uh, Jeff, thank you. Uh, Senator, as we move forward, if, if you have a question as we go, feel free to raise it. And certainly we reserve time at the end for both questions and, and uh, comments that you might like, like to make. So probably what I'll do is I'll, I'll wait till you're completed and then I'll, so I don't interrupt the flow. Okay, perfect. And uh, let me just summarize the, uh, the Worston uh, ex example that uh, Jeff used for Worston Dungeness, uh, a real allocation. All we faced were 31 commercial permits and 127,000 licensed recreational fishers. Those 31 permits were receiving 60% of the total crab resource for the state. Uh, obviously the 137,000, about 40%. Uh, through a public process, uh, through a lot of good science and data, uh, we brought that back to a 50-50 balance, and uh, I, I think it's it's a good example of what councils could do if they followed some of the state processes uh, that we have. Let's move then to issue number three. That is <clears throat> that is the uh, options to better address tough management challenges, and uh, George Cooper who is a senior advisor to the American Sports Fishing Association is up, George. Thank you very much, Raleigh. So I'm gonna hit a couple of, of more technical points fairly briefly. Before I do that, I just wanna sort of take a, the opportunity to frame things up here as we walk up to this next Magnuson reauthorization. You know, we're in a different situation than we've ever experienced. This will be the first one without Senator Stevens, without Senator Inouye, other old friends that this community and, and those interested in fishery issues got used to working with over the years. And it's been very heartening for us as you've taken chairmanship of that subcommittee, the Ocean Subcommittee, um, particularly when you're looking at a Commerce Committee that has a chairman from West Virginia and a ranking member from South Dakota, to look at the subcommittee and see a chair from Alaska <laughs> and the ranking member. in those states. Yeah, that's small. true, absolutely. <laughs> um, and a ranking member from, from Florida and Senator Rubio, that's been heartening. What's been far more heartening is the follow through that you've made on your pledge from the beginning, uh, you and your staff, to learn about the fishery issues that, that we're grappling with in the lower 48. You know, from some of our earliest discussions, I think you looked at us and said, well, why don't you guys take a closer look at what we're doing up here in Alaska? We said, that's exactly what we wanna do and, and think about um, how we can apply some of those things further south. But I just want to, on behalf of ASA and the other groups represented here, thank you for that. It's been a real pleasure to work with Bob King. Bob's already getting into a lot of this stuff with us. Uh, and Senator Rubio and his staff has been great to work with as well. Um, the two things I'm going to hit, you actually referenced in your remarks to the Managing Our Nations Fisheries Conference a few months ago in Washington and things we've talked with your staff about. I'll, I'll hit them fairly quickly. But I think one thing I just want to be clear on from my point of view in terms of overarching themes that hopefully sink into your brain as you depart today is that we're really looking at a historic opportunity as we walk up to this next Magnuson uh, reauthorization. And by the way, the fact that we're having this kind of conversation this early, um, contemplating the fact that you're, you're, you're going to be taking a thoughtful uh, approach to this over the next year, year and a half or so, is, is very much appreciated. But what we're talking about is a moment in time that seems right for recognizing that the commercial management overlay 
that has been applied to recreational fishing doesn't make sense. We have examples of that we've already hit on and that we have an opportunity before us to recognize with these economic figures in mind and the different nature of these of these two pursuits and, and ways of, of, of interacting with the resource to do some different things. Um, the two pieces I'll just hit on uh, probably best fall under the category of, of, of good intentions that have um, that haven't played out as some might have hoped. Um, when when we uh, looked at rebuilding back in 06, um, a 10 year timeline was was chosen and what we've ended up doing is kind of coming at this, well, it was originated before that, but we've ended up with sort of a one size fits all approach that in some cases has worked just fine, but it's, it is in fact arbitrary. And there's some stocks that don't fit within that, that time frame. And you know, so much of what we try to do, particularly as we think about Magnuson is watch how the councils operate, listen to what council members say. In some cases, we're looking at doing some things that deal with what they have not been willing to do in, in the case of allocations. In other cases, we're listening to them as they've dealt with this rebuilding time frame, for example. I think you've already heard testimony before your committee regarding the council's need to have some more latitude and flexibility when it comes to this 10-year rebuilding time frame. And um, you know, I won't, I won't go into more of the technical details. If you've got questions on that, we've talked with you about it, we've talked with Bob about it. And this one seems compared to some of the other things like this, neat, this neat little allocation <laughs> thing, a more straightforward matter of getting the branch out. Jeff's and, issues are a little more. <laughs> <laughs> this, this perhaps yeah, falls more into the, the, the tinkering category, but we certainly wanted to highlight that today. There's no question that's a priority for us. Uh, the other point I'll just hit briefly is what we've seen with the setting of ACLs. Again, setting ACLs for every federally managed stock and stock complex at the time seemed like a generally reasonable idea. Doing it under the deadline that was set, you know, four years out didn't seem bad. But then as we walked up and watched a, a, an agency have even fewer resources than it had in 06, um, certainly couldn't gather more data. We ended up setting ACLs on stocks, which we had no up-to-date data or very little data. And it seems a certainty to us that we're gonna end up bumping into problems where an arbitrary ACL that's been set within a, multi within a complex is gonna be triggered and you're gonna end up having decisions about closing down an entire complex. We dodged a bullet on this in the South Atlantic where hundreds of square miles were gonna be closed to bottom fishing based on one ACL that it, when Noah went back and took another look decided, wow, we may not have completely gotten that right, and that helped us dodge that bullet. But that seems certainly like it might be coming down the pike. So again, this is perhaps more in the category of getting the wrench out, making some adjustments. But we would we would recommend that we think about those complexes in a different way, uh, managing with aggregates in mind, not species by species within that complex. Um, the other thing I think it's important to note is you know as long as we have these ACLs set, we we would advocate using them as sort of red flags, if you will. So we keep an eye on those stocks. If red flags pop up, we climb back in and do a, you know, a, a more traditional stock assessment. Um, but that's, a, that's an adjustment we think is, is, is very much uh, necessary. So those are those two points. But thank you again. Always good. <clears throat> and George, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have our fourth issue we'd like to present and that is uh, alternative management approaches for marine recreational fisheries. And I ask that uh, Pat Murray, who is the president for the Coastal Conservation Association, CCA. Pat, take it away. Raleigh, thanks. Uh, Senator, thank you very much. Absolutely. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for organizing this event. So many people were a part of it. Um, having spent the last few days in Alaska, what a great setting um, to have a discussion like this. I will say, I had hoped you could come to a state like Alaska and not hear three words, Gulf Red Snapper. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're talking You'll about fisheries, <laughs> <laughs> um, there will one day be a gathering like this where we won't talk about Gulf Red Snapper other than, man, isn't that amazing how much better that got. Um, but I do want to speak for a few moments about recreational fishing and how it is so fundamentally different than commercial fishing. Maybe some alternative approaches, but also too, 
a little bit to the spirit of recreational angling and why it is so different and why the current federal management system doesn't always fit it. Um, to say that recreational and commercial fisheries are fundamentally different, that's pretty obvious. Um, there's no doubt about it. We, as recreational anglers, um, pursue our quarry with different gear, different goals, and thus have very different needs in terms of data collection and in terms of a management system. And we're seeing more and more examples where that traditionally kind of commercially based federal system really isn't applying to these fisheries. Um, honestly, commercial fisheries are, are executed so differently where they can have real-time data um, and captured on verified landings. And that's really not the case of recreational anglers. Very dispersed fisheries, if you think about it, very dispersed efforts and dynamic fisheries. Um, there's literally millions of people who are pursuing saltwater recreational fishing on all coasts. And so in that divergence, those fishermen themselves are very nimble, very adaptive. Uh, many in this room could speak to that. Um, and so the system has to fit that better to manage that. And think about, there's an example that comes to mind um, in Jeff's hometown of Venice, Louisiana. Um, it, maybe some of you all have enjoyed a fishery like that. They're, they're in a lot of areas where you have this incredible diversity where you could leave in the morning and be pursuing well, I'll say it, red snapper, um, and king mackerel in 100 to 300 feet of water, and a weather change has you switch around and you re-gear, and an hour later you're pursuing red drum and speckled trout in three feet of water in a marsh. That's recreational angling. It's really always changing. And so the system doesn't always fit it. Capturing real-time and accurate data, it's, it's virtually impossible um, when you think about fisheries like that. And also, too, there's a significant lag time when you're trying to collect recreational data. Uh, we see so many times where a season gets closed and you have more and more disillusionment among recreational anglers. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to a couple of folks before this is that I doubt there's many people right now in the Gulf that, of Mexico who would say, I'm a red snapper fisherman. They may go red snapper fishing, but with a season that's measured in a handful of days, with the vagaries of weather and all those sorts of things, you might go for that fish, but you're not someone who pursues that fish, like they might be a trout fisherman or a redfish fisherman. You just don't have that because it's just squished that sort of spirit out of the fishery. It doesn't exist anymore. So what we're seeing is you can't count every fish in recreational fisheries. And to try to create a system that does is just asymmetrical at best. And so instead of trying to force that system, I think we need to look at alternative approaches. And I think the states show many of those. When you look at state-based compacts like the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and how they've managed striped bass, or even some examples of states themselves managing their fisheries, be it red drum, um, speckled trout, um, snook, so many of these fisheries where you're looking more at a harvest rate and you're looking at regular assessments where you're looking at the stock and you're not trying to count it the way we do with commercial fisheries. Um, we've seen that work, and I think there's more and more opportunity, particularly as we look at Magnuson, to integrate that in as an option, as a tool in the, in the, in the chest to work with. Um, you know, Red Snapper begs for it. It's one that, that we've tried uh, various things, I think, through this existing federal system, and they just continue to not work. Um, and even to take a step back and... Um, and in trying to understand the recreational angler and what drives that $70 billion in economic output that Tom spoke to and those hundreds of thousands of jobs um, is, is really that, that spirit, that passion. And with recreational anglers, it's really not a passion that's driven by market price and, or fish fillets for that matter. Um, it's, it's, it's a passion to go. And it was interesting after the Macondo well incident in the Gulf. Um, I spoke to many, many groups about the resilience of anglers. At that time, there were a lot of folks that just didn't want to go because of everything that was going on with that oil spill. And, um, and it's interesting how much we see that same sort of disillusionment with a lot of our federal fisheries because that system seems that unappealing, seems that unapproachable. And uh, when I was speaking about that issue, I was reminded of, his, of a quote, and I think it applies right here. Um, a Scottish writer, um, John Buchan, who had this wonderful quote that I think captured recreational fishing. 
which is the, the charm of fishing is the pursuit of that which is elusive but obtainable. And here's the key part of it. A perpetual series of occasions for hope. That's powerful. Occasions for hope. That's what drives that $70 billion, is an occasion for hope. And it's not an occasion to meet your quota or an occasion for market price. It's the hope. It's the desire to go fishing, the hope to catch a few, maybe take a few home, but that's what drives that. And what happens is these restrictive seasons that don't seem to fit reality and these asymmetrical management measures and systems and strategies disillusion that occasion for hope. And that is what kills recreational angling. And the more we can do to enhance recreational angling and enhance that spirit, I think the more we can do to build all the other great things that come with it, like stronger state and federal economies of growth from that, and, and, and great conservation. It was touched on a couple times today. Some of the greatest conservation victories that are out there were driven by recreational anglers. And I think anyone who's fished the last couple of days knows that feeling of occasion for hope, um, no matter what the weather. Um, but that speaks to that passion. You know, what makes people go out and be soaked to the bone and freezing cold and pursuing their quarry that they might take home or they might not. It's about the, that occasion. And, uh, or, or you might be in a, right now on a flat in South Texas um, in knee deep water and it's 100 degrees and the wind's blowing you know, 20 from the Southeast. Same thing, it really transcends time. It gets back to those <coughs> millions of people pursuing this in these incredibly dispersed and divergent areas all pursuing that occasion for hope. So anything we can do to, to do better manage that, I think when we look to the states, that's where we see that happen the most. So as we move forward, I hope we all can keep that in mind as an important lesson in how to better manage our recreational fisheries. Pat, thank you. Uh, Senator, I think some of us are still hoping after this week uh, for the catch. Uh, your time, are you uh, really tight? Uh, we have to, I have to depart at uh, about 10 till, 5 till, so right in there. Okay. So. Uh, Rod Riley, if I could, um, we want to be respectful of the Senator's time. So I, I think what needs to happen now before we turn it over to the Senator, uh, incidentally, uh, if people in the audience have questions that they'd like to ask to the panel, the panel will be here after the senator leaves. We have to be respectful of his time. He's got to be somewhere else. We don't. So <laughs> we're going to hold questions and answers to the very end. Uh, we will be here as long as it takes to answer your questions. But before we pass this over to the senator, I would like to sum up specifically what are we asking you to do? First and foremost, the overriding issue, we want language in the next reauthorization that's specific and focused on recreational fishing because it hasn't existed previously. Uh, to these individual issues, um, we do want within the reauthorization for the economic value and impact of recreational fishing to be addressed because it hasn't been previously. We would like to see language that takes a different approach to allocation to recreational fishing than to commercial fishing. We can't apply somebody else's standards to us any more than we could apply our standards to them. Lastly, I believe, and perhaps you do as well, that the regional councils are really bound and handcuffed by guidelines that were written to address commercial fishing. We need them to have guidelines and flexibility to address recreational issues separately and distinctly from commercial fishing. Um, and I think as Pat eloquently said, this is a different business, a different industry from commercial fishing and we need management approaches within the fishery service and at the regional council level that can be applied reasonably and effectively to recreational fishing because what we're doing isn't working. And as much as I love the National Marine Fishery Service, they are still focused exclusively on commercial fishing 
And I believe, and I think this panel believes, it all starts with the reauthorization of Magnus and Stevens by getting language in there that specifically addresses these unique challenges with the recreational fishing, and it has too much economic value, and there's too many participants to let this go any longer without addressing it. So that's, I think, in summaration, what we want to say. Are we all in agreement? Did I say it correctly, or do you have more? <laughs> Phil, I think you said it correctly. Uh, let me embellish on a couple points. Having uh, spent 25 years in NIMS and being the head of NIMS, I think that it might really help uh, to ask them to develop a set of criteria for the reauthorization. Otherwise, we could end up in a reauthorization and need some sort of blueprint to work from. I think that would jumpstart uh, what's needed in that point. Uh, the second point is developing regulatory strategies for recreational fisheries that focus on fishing opportunities. And this is very similar to what Alaska does, what Washington does, by using harvest guidelines rather than the fixed quotas and numbers that we see. And uh, the fourth, and I, I believe it was uh, perhaps George brought it up, and that is providing the council's additional flexibility in the 10-year rebuilding requirement. Uh, <clears throat> that doesn't always meet fisheries life cycles. And so you may have a very slow rebuilding fish driving this multi-complex of fisheries. So a little flexibility, and I know that the councils themselves would be asking you for that consideration. So that's just uh, augmenting exactly what Phil said. Senator, uh, it's your mic. Thanks. And uh, we would each be able to answer any questions that you have, or uh, we'd be really anxious to hear your comments on what we said. Sure. And it's okay to slap us if we said something that you think is <laughs> not correct. Very good. Uh, Phil, thank you. Thanks to all of you setting this up. Thanks for uh, being patient while we I uh, got here by plane. And uh, second, thank you for allowing me, as you know, the way I operate, many of you who have already participated in some activities with me, I don't like to waste a lot of time. So that's why I ate lunch while listening rather than having lunch, then coming. Um, try to make things as efficient as possible. So I appreciate you uh, bearing with me there. Because um, that is my probably my only meal for the day. Uh, so let me uh, say a couple things. First, um, as you know, uh, the way we're approaching the reauthorization is, uh, and I think Georgie said it is a very thoughtful, uh, deliberate process. We're not going to rush into it because there's some schedule. Uh, I think Congress has a bad habit of that, and usually creating bad legislation in the process. They, see some date they arbitrarily picked and then they rush to the den and they said we're done they move on and find out later there's major problems with what they put together uh, we recognize reauthorization that technically uh, needs to be done before the end of the year but that does not mean we have to have a bill before the end of the year for those that have worked in Washington understand that process senator what's your best guess when there will be a bill yeah right? I well there's two debates we're having in our in our office right now one is as you know we've and, and for folks that are you know interested in this issue this has been uh, right after this I'll do another roundtable yes. hearing listening session we've done a series uh, and hopefully those that have been around this issue for a fairly long time on a legislative end will recognize we're trying to do something where every user group is at the table. But we've had one around commercial, we've had one around subsistence, uh, which interestingly enough, subsistence will say the same thing, that they were kind of excluded, right. or limited, I should say, not excluded, right. but limited in, in the activity. And now, of course, recreation, and then there'll be continuing listening sessions. And then we'll have a series of sessions that will be more hearings in Washington that will focus on the regions, uh, New England, Gulf, Alaska, uh, Northwest, and George, you might have saw the one we did recently, which was kind of an adjunct to New England. It wasn't totally supposed to be New England, but it really focused in on MSA reauthorization. Right. The 10-year issue really popped up yeah. a couple times, and I've heard that. And, and you know, the 10-year, I don't know the exact reason why that was picked, but no one, Congress, everything runs on Congressional Budget Office timetables, which are 10 years, which... You know, I won't go into my rant about Congressional Budget Office, but uh, I recognize um, just as fish know no borders, they have different timelines. My hope is that, and again, we're debating internally, do we put down a frame early? And I mentioned it at that conference, I think, mm -hmm. three months ago, whenever. So we have a kind of a frame to work from. 
or do we wait until as much information is in? And we're debating that right now, actually. In the next few weeks, we'll make that determination. I think at the end of the day, either track we take, the chances of having a bill by, you know, I would hope first quarter, second quarter of next year is kind of a target. Um, only because when you get into the holiday season and the budget issues are lingering, it's very complex. Uh, yes. Unless, you know, honestly, we, we you know, I, I, I think the, the phrase, the, the occasion of hope, I think you said, uh, I'm always about that in the legislative process, especially, and the Senate needs that more than ever. Um, and, you know, maybe something happens by our process that creates such a few issues to work on that we might be able to get a sizable amount put on the table before the holidays. But I, I don't, just because our schedule and the budget. So I'm, I'm hoping for a second quarter. Um, our sense of this is quite similar to yours. We would rather see all the information first, and we would rather see a ready shoot aim approach as opposed to a ready um, shoot aim. In other words, get the information, do a ready aim shoot as opposed to a ready shoot aim. I hear you. Um, and then the other thing I, I want to say in this kind of response, um, you know, there's there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle. You gave me. Uh, uh, some thoughts here. You were so kind to hand me the uh, your blank paper that I told them I have a technique here. Uh, these are items I got to take back. These are items related to the issue. I write them on the stuff I'm working on. And but but one that in, intrigued me, and, it, and you didn't say it, but I thought about it, and that is one of the challenges we will have. Let's assume for a moment we have a bill done. It passes. It meets a lot of the issues. We're still going to have controversy because there's still going to be you know, all three groups, as I described them, will still have issues at the end of the day, but hopefully we'll limit that. But let's just say we have a bill, we've come to a conclusion, we've compromised, we have four. One of the pieces that has to be part of this equation is what happens five years from now, these agencies that are supposed to do the work, may they be doing uh, stock assessments or additional research? Because one piece that wasn't in uh, the Magnuson Stevens Act is climate change. That's impacting. Citification of waters, you never had that discussion 10 years ago, but it is an impact. And we got to figure that out and put that, because somehow the money disappears because of some budget cuts or some rant someone gets on because they don't like NOAA and they want to cut it all to pieces. We got to, somehow the bill has to reflect if that changes. Right. Because what could happen, as I'm seeing now, I mean, we are very fortunate in Alaska that we can do these stock assessments on a readily and easy, I don't say easy available, but on a, on a pretty frequent basis. But my three trips now to the New England states, it's a whole different ballgame. And it's a funding issue. If they would have more resources to do the stock assessment, we'd have better science, therefore making better decisions. But they're penalized on this 10-year issue. They can't get there on some of these stocks. First off, they don't have the right assessment in science. And second, the information is not as readily available as it could be if they were funded properly for multiple years ahead. So it just gave me a thought, I made a note that it's something we gotta put in our pile and it may be very complex to figure that out, but we cannot set up a kind of panacea of where we think fisheries will be 10 years from now. And then oh, on the other hand, over here, as an appropriator, we slice and dice you and then go, well now, succeed. Well, that, that's not gonna work. And so you know, I'm fortunate I get to be as chair of the subcommittee, but also on their appropriations committee. So it's giving me some thought here that we got to put in perspective. So I just want to put that on the table. So just a quick note on that. I mean, one of the mantras that comes up in all of our conversations about this and something we were hoping to impart today, but I just want to highlight right now while it's on your mind, is we constantly talk about managing for the data you have, not the data you wish you had. Right. And that's certainly some of what we're seeking to correct here. So, so that overarching thought is one we're applying to the recommendations. We're going to continue presenting to you, your colleagues. Good. We have to be realistic. We, we, I think we strongly, strongly agree with what, Good. what you're saying. The other one is one you all mentioned, and actually the commercial guides also mention it on a fairly regular basis now, and that's to really look at the economic impacts. Because, for example, you might have a, let's just use a commercial fisheries, that gets closed because an issue that another agency has determined, maybe the endangered species, that maybe. As we know in Alaska, there's some issues around that that aren't really endangered, but you know, but it has an impact not to the fisheries only, but to all the other pieces. Flip side, recreation, you shrink the fisheries, halibut catch, example. It has an impact to all the charter businesses onshore. 
Noah lacks, in my opinion, and since day one, and they've heard me say this over and over again, that full understanding of economic analysis, both from the fisheries component, but the secondary and other businesses related to it. That has to be part of this whole equation. And I, and I think you're going to see, and what's interesting, I think you're going to find between commercial and rec folks a unified view. Because I can tell you in New England, they're very outraged by the lack of that understanding. Right. And they're trying to figure out how do they get that into the mix. And when you were at, I don't know if you were at that one where uh, the gentleman from New England brought this issue up, and it was a very interesting comment. I thought it was very powerful because I've heard it now from rec and commercial. Now, maybe there's views of how you measure that, but the fact is we don't have the resources or the skill level, I, I believe. Now, I'm sure I'm going to hear from Noah tomorrow um, that they do, but uh, they've heard from me on the regular basis. They don't have that. And we I need to have that in this couldn't business. agree with you more. It, after working with um, NIMPS as an advisor for three years, it's pretty easy to see what their comfort level is and where their expertise is and where it isn't. Right. And I always say, who sits next to me? It's the, um, it's the subsistence fishing people. It's the aquaculture guys. It's all of these people that are on the outside looking in because NIMPS doesn't have the, the capability of acting in those areas. Right. And I think the biggest economic impact we have to recognize and where this is killing us as a, as a country, the, the percentage of seafood that we import. Right. What is it, 90%? Well, and, and the sad part is, uh, not only imported, as you know, I have legislation pending now on what I call pirate fishing, people who yes. steal our fish. Yes. Uh, and then, or like we're dealing with Russia right now uh, with our crab, when they call it Alaska crab, when it's clearly not, uh, and several others where it's impacting us on a, a huge economic level. I mean, huge. And uh, then it also trickles down into all the other areas, subsistence, recreational, and others. And so we, we uh, the, my hope is when we look at Magnus and Stevens, it's kind of a broader, and I think that's where you all are talking about, because at the end of the day, um, we know, and my view is, you know, maybe I could be very biased here and say, hey, Alaska's doing it right, rest of the country, fend for yourselves. But the reality is that's not responsible. And as chair of this committee, it's not only to make what we're doing in Alaska be even better, but figure out how to take some of these models and pieces uh, and see if there's ways to use these examples, which of course more localized by the region, to figure out how to improve their commercial rec and if they have subsistence type of fishing. Most don't, of course, have subsistence. But. My key point is if we screw this up, there are negative economic oh. impacts that are enormous. If you ask the catfish farmers today, they will tell you yeah. if they're they're barely hanging on. Right. We eat Chinese the, catfish and Vietnamese shrimp. Right. But nobody <laughs> knows that. Right. You know, and again, huge, in high volumes, in, in enormous volumes, yes. huge economic <laughs> impact. So it's it's jobs across the table. Let me say a couple more quick things. Then I'm going to pause, and, and I know my time is going to be cut here real quick. But one other thing that's related to Alaska, but will relate to all of you and groups you represent, as well as to many others. Uh, we have pending a revenue sharing bill. This revenue sharing bill is for the oil and gas development on, in the Arctic. We've also added a, an item in there. As you know, the Land and Conservation Fund, which is critical to habitat protection around the country, uh, usually gets funded 270, 300 million in the last couple of years because some increase has been able to put in there. But it's authorized to 900 million. What this bill does is make sure we get the full funding, 900 million, outside of the appropriations process. So it's actually funded on a regular basis without the interruption or the theft, right. as I would call it, from other elected officials who think it's for some other purpose. And this to me is powerful because when you think about your groups, but then you add one other group, the sport hunting groups in this country, this is a double. And then you take the recreational, non-sports or fishermen type, people who just go to parks and recreation and so forth, be able to have that resource in there to help uh, do urban to rural land conservation, water conservation is important. But 300 million is not enough. Subject to appropriations is a problem, and the longer term should be outside through a revenue stream that we think we have the model to do that. So just a little food for thought on that. Um, the, the last thing I'll say, and 
you know, this is one I, again, appreciate all of you doing this. Um, you know, every time I do one, and I'll be very frank with you, when I do recreation, then I'll hear from the commercial and subsistence. When I do commercial, I hear from the subsistence and rec. When I do subsistence, I hear from commercial and rec. And that's just normal. And don't forget uh, the environmental groups. Well, those are across the board. But I think what's important is our process. We're going to try to not deviate from this. And that is really a process of thoughtful laying on the table. Also, educating staff and members. Uh, some of you have participated, as you know, I chair the steering and outreach committee for the Senate, uh, that is, which is the fifth position of leadership for the Senate. Some of you have participated in our roundtables we've had uh, to educate members about the issues that we're facing on sports as well as fishing issues. Uh, it's been very helpful. And I think the approach we want to take as we move down here too is utilizing organizations to continue that education process. This is, I think this is the first time you've done something like this, right? Around the classic. That's right. Yeah. And, and we, we would like to make this an annual event or something of this type. I, I think it's a great An idea. annual event because how do we make CURSA relevant to all 50 states right. by using what they know, the knowledge that they've gained, the knowledge that's been gained in Alaska on a national basis? And what better place to do that than at the Kenai River Classic? Right. I, I think it's a great It doesn't idea. kill us to be here, by the way. We kind right. of like know. this. It's, it's a lot of struggle. <laughs> oh, got to go up to the Kenai in the summer. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really great idea. And I th thank you guys for doing this because I, I think every group on fishing in this, and I have this, um, you know, when you look at fishing issues, may they be rec or commercial, they're always kind of, to the larger industries of the country, they're secondary. And I'll give you an example on the commercial end first. You know, we debated the farm bill, right? Well, big bill, very important. But why do we debate the farm bill? Because it's harvesting on the land. Important to our food supply. But we don't get an equal debate on harvesting our waters. There's no equal bill, legislation, or anything. Then you take the economies. We talk about manufacturing. We talk about uh, all the other airline industry. You go through the list. Recreational activities, fishing included in that, are kind of secondary. Even though your numbers, uh, our tourism business, would not be able to do what they're doing without all the recreational components. That means national parks. That means fisheries, habitat, all of this combined. And in this country, the industry that came back, one of the fastest industries that came back after this recovery was our recreational industry, our tourism industry. And who does that feed? We're sitting in this room. But it wasn't really counted. And when you look right. at the GDP and all those big numbers we talk about, this is kind of like over there. So part of my goal is not only to talk about commercial and the fishing and the food supply that it provides to this country and what it should provide to this country, but also the recreational piece how important that is in the long term to our economy. And then the third, which is more Alaska-centric, uh, is subsistence. Uh, I think when you think of your 2%, they're at 1%. So the big debates occur over the 3% when you think about it in Alaska. Nationally, it's over the 2%. And so we have to figure out this balance because it's all, when you look across the board, it's all good for the economy. And it's all good for job creation, but it's also trying to make it a more uh, relevant when people, when, I, I'd love them one day to say when they talk about the GDP, they quit saying just manufacturing. I mean, I, I agree with that because in reality, everything you guys do on your end, there's manufacturing related to it. Someone has to build those boats, those motors. Uh, in the commercial end, they're manufacturing by producing a product in raw material out of the sea and producing it to a final product. So we, we are an industry that uh, needs to be more defined and more recognized, and I say collectively, fishing industry or seafood industry or seafood fishing industry. So thank you for doing this today. Second, for those that have additional comments that you prepare them, I know your folks are letting us know. If there's something that comes out of this group afterwards, you should feel free to share that with us and the committee. As chair of the Oceans Committee, that deals with fisheries, NOAA, and Coast Guard, this is an important role we'll have. And then we'll have continued hearings and series, and later today we'll have another hearing. So thank you all very much for doing this. This is very informative, and uh, you gave me some thoughts on some ideas. But I also see more common thread, and I know in the past, and Jeff, you said it best, um, <laughs> these can be contentious issues. Fish are like, you know, I remember I was on the assembly, and I had some ordinance messing around with cats. 
you don't, you know, the last thing I'll ever do is touch someone's pets. Uh, that's a, <laughs> and fish are pretty darn close. Uh, you know, there's a lot of tension, but, but when you look at the issues of, as I think I have to this date, there's about an 85% common thread. That's what we got to focus on. Debate the 15, compromise where we can, close it up and deal with it for the long term. And I think there is a way to do this. Uh, I am full of occasional hope. <laughs> More than probably I should be. Uh, and I recognize the passions that come in this room with you all. Uh, that's an important part of figuring this out. So thank you for just being part of this today and willingness to let us do this. And I, I think it's a great idea if you decide to do something similar to this on an annual basis. I think it's a great way to educate folks. And thank we did you it in much. a very concise way. I know we were tight on time, so you really compressed your stuff down, but it was very um, informational. Thank well, you all. Thank you very much. And Senator, thank you for your sacrifices in getting here. And if all of us, before we get into Q&A, if all of us remember just one thing, with the reauthorization of Magnus and Stevens, we really need to have separate and distinct language that addresses recreational fishing and identifies its separate and uniqueness from commercial fishing. Thank you. Can Senator, introduce, thank you. Can I just say Shauna Toma back here, my state director, raise your hand, Shauna, so they know. She's also, Shana. as you know, many of you worked with her with fishing issues, yep. so she kind of has dual role. Um, I don't know where Kim just went. Did she just walk out? Okay, Kim is our Kenai Peninsula area. I know you saw her Monday night, I think. At the spot, dinner, so, and that was great. And uh, I don't know where Heather Handyside went, but she's a communications way in the back, works in my Anchorage office, Alaska Communications, so just so you all know. But again, thank you all very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thanks for being a sport. No, no, no.